Chelsea, thank you all for venturing out on this snowy winter's night. Tonight we're pleased to welcome William Bowman, who is going to talk about his newly published book, Riding Toward Everywhere. As I'm sure you all know, William Bowman is the author of seven novels, the most recent of which, Europe Central, won the National Book Award in 2005. He's also author of three collections of stories and the seven volume critique of violence, Rising Up and Rising Down. His last book, Poor People, has just been released in paperback. In Riding Toward Everywhere, the author travels across America, riding both regular trains and, wherever possible, hopping freight trains with a friend called Brian and another named Steve Jones, to whom the book is dedicated. <clears throat> Before my voice pegs out, please join me in welcoming William Volman. fail 
Or would even the canniest garage warrior have been defeated by now by time? While writing this essay, I finally threw away my father's power planer, whose rusty bed wobbled so dangerously when I fingered the switch that I feared it might whirl apart in my hands. When I ride the rails, I experience the same rusty shuddering of bare metal. I am going back to the time when my father's tools were new. Present realities fall away faster and faster. They cannot stop me any more than the flashlights of functionaries. Indeed, that night, the boxcar seemed to be speeding upward like a rocket under attack from anti-rocket missiles. It roared at what felt to be an ever-increasing velocity, took evasive action by shaking from side to side, and every now and then lurched horribly as if it had just been hit. Sometimes I would be awakened from a light doze by the boxcar's sudden slamming as if there had been an accident. Amidst all this shrieking and creaking, the immense open door amazed me, first exposing me to myself in the lighted city of the men's prison immediately to the west, then offering multitudes of foggy pictures all the way to dawn. I felt as if every possibility were offering itself through the doorway without trickery. The infinities available to me paraded as beguilingly as clock figures on a medieval church tower. Before I knew it, I was asleep again, dreaming over choices I had been too sensible or cowardly to make. My loyal friends woke me up because we were coming into Salinas. I leaped up, fully clothed and shoed like a soldier slung my pack to my shoulder and was ready. But the train kept going. My friend stood dismayed. Well, it was nice while it lasted, I said, and went back to sleep. Six hours later, the boxcar was still speeding and roaring toward everywhere. We glimpsed cornfields and then the half-constructed houses of our ever-swarming California. It was a dirty sort of day. Just as a river glimpsed between the girders of a trestle bridge may decay into ordinariness when one actually goes swimming in it, so a landscape, particularly one maimed by human beings, will often be reduced by light to the merest concatenation of stunted or even poisonous possibilities. Although the box car was still, objectively speaking, huge, now that all the obscene drawings could be glimpsed from one end to the other, our traveling gallery seemed to have shrunk. Its grimy, rusty floor had grown drearier, and even the fabulous rectangle of real life projected upon its open movie screen was less enchanting, in part because most California cities are ugly in part because I had hardly slept, and surely in some measure, because riding the rails, like any attempt to escape from life, must taste of failure every now and then, unless one is willing to die.